But sometimes if our focus is simply on uh, being comfortable or or getting this problem solved, we can we can lose sight of that bigger picture and and our responsibility and calling to bring glory to him through our interactions. Happy to be here with John Koblenz, um, recording a few episodes this morning, this one, and a couple others to be released later. Yeah, John, you want to just give a very brief introduction to yourself or some of your work? Uh, well, I serve at uh, Faith Builders Educational Programs. I've served there as a campus pastor um, and instructor. I've uh, been there for about 18 years and um, have really um, enjoyed the opportunity um, that it has offered me to study, to teach, uh, to learn, and uh, been very grateful. The um, last uh, couple of years now, I have been giving off some of my classes to younger ones, but uh, still teach there. Yeah, 18 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long because, hmm. yeah, you came there at the end of my time living in that area and being around faith builders, and we we interacted a little bit, but it was also hmm. the time when our sister church started there, so we didn't actually go to church together. But mm-hmm. Went to youth group and so on. So yeah, I was intrigued by your recent book. Uh, it was a commentary on Ephesians, and you gave it the title, um, God's Glory in the Church. And yeah, to start with, maybe just explain, you know, why that book or why that title? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I would understand uh, God's glory to be a fairly central or overarching theme of of Scripture, actually. Uh, you see it, uh, the emphasis in creation, the emphasis then obviously in the, the plan to redeem, to bring us back uh, to God. And I think Ephesians probably, uh, Paul in that letter uh, explains uh, the the glory of God as as really a uh, central purpose in redemption, mm-hmm. that it's a, it's a display of his glory. And we see that in the opening chapter a number of times he says uh, to the praise of his glory that uh, we were chosen in him before time, and it's to the praise of his glory or the glory of his grace. Um, and then that we, we live, we are those, actually Paul saying that, those who first trusted in Christ, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And then the wrapping up of the redemption unto the praise of his glory. It, it, so you get this past, this present, this future work mm-hmm. of God, and it's it's huge, and, and, and it's all for his glory. Yeah, and the, the scope there is so big. Yeah. And, I mean, honestly, I was reading through your commentary, and I'm thinking— Okay, this sounds, you know, the words you write sound over the top. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, maybe my experience doesn't match this. This Mm -hmm. doesn't acknowledge problems or whatever. And then I was like, well, wait, you're writing a commentary on Ephesians. And Ephesians is all about Mm -hmm. (laughs) unpacking all that glorious stuff. If you were in 1 Corinthians, well, you'd see the other side Mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And we will. Um come around in a future episode to address some of that mm-hmm. underside of when the church doesn't display that glory well. And I'd also say, you know, um, the the picture that we get in Ephesians is, is that actually God's glory is being displayed in ways that are larger than actually about us or our time or our sphere maybe even, but that what he's doing in Christ is actually uh, displaying his glory, the the wisdom of God to principalities and powers. So it's it's more than about us. He's doing something in the heavens or in the heavenlies, as Paul used that expression. So it's it's this this huge things that we actually then are something of the display of God's glorious grace and wisdom and uh, mercy. Uh, that he's displaying to heavenly powers. Yeah, good. So there's an edge there that 
we may not even see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not for a human audience only. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So along with that, and you use the word, you talked a lot about God gathering or assembling people mm -hmm. into the church. And you'd often used assembly with a capital A there in Ephesians, um, which I like the wording. Um, but maybe talk about that. Yeah, what is the church in Ephesians that's displaying God's glory? And I'm thinking about it because most of the time in the New Testament, we come across church and it says, you know, the church that meets in somebody's house or mm. the church is in this city. And it's very, you know, particular gatherings. But then in Ephesians, it seems to be, am I understanding it right? It seems to be this reference to like believers across time and place and everything. Mm. Um, yeah. How do you see that? And maybe a little bit how those relate. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, uh, the sense of assembly or gathering is something that we can miss with the common use of the word church. Uh, we can easily associate church with a building or uh, and, and a locality. And the picture we get in Ephesians is certainly this, this pulling together, this coming together of all things in Christ and all, it includes believers from around the world from all time. So that's the bigger one. Mm -hmm. But obviously there is the assembling also, the coming together in localities, which... Um, which is where we actually are experiencing Christ, and yet it's it's um, it, it's energizing and invigorating, and uh, just expands our understanding to realize that we're part of this larger, much larger around the world, around uh, cross time, that we are assembled together with. And so I, I, I like that larger picture, which which enables us, I think, in times of perhaps disagreement or distress or trouble in our local settings to, to keep the bigger picture in mind that um, so th they're they're not antithetical to each other they're it's 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 a uh, together it's both local and global uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's helpful and I feel like I've went on a mm. Well, okay, I've seen the need to emphasize different parts, I guess, mm -hmm. over life. So a number of years ago, I think I was especially sensitive to, you know, people who talk about, well, the church is all believers and then just wouldn't emphasize the actually functioning together mm -hmm. in groups. And so that led me to kind of a, you know, a stronger emphasis on the local church where you're actually gathered and actually functioning. Um, but then... Yeah, I've come to realize exactly that point that you were making. If we just focus on the local church and lose sight of that bigger piece, hmm. or if we think our local churches are self-contained and we don't need input from other believers or something, that becomes, you know, you get this small world pretty uh -huh. quickly if you think yeah. it's all, if you think we can be by ourselves in one congregation or whatever. Hmm. So the church displays God's glory. It's group of people around the world brought together. You have all this glorious language in in Ephesians. Um, but how much of that depends on the things that are actually going on in actual relationships, hmm. whether they're locally or even believers relating from around the world? Um, and so I'm thinking about it as I think about Ephesians. Um, ethnic reconciliation is a big theme. Um, this idea of unity, um, the gifts of the Spirit, you know, separation from evil, um, loving each other. Yeah, how much of that display of glory depends on, like, these things actually happening in hmm. specific relationships? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, I think... It's a, uh, always the challenge because we are still imperfect. We are still growing into the likeness or maybe continually growing into the likeness of Jesus as each generation comes, as new believers come in. As, and so we're, we're always facing the challenge of demonstrating the glory of God uh, in, our, in our local settings with our imperfections. And I... Um, I don't have all the answers for 
um, what that means for local uh, settings, and yet I I care about I, I I think if we can see when we're facing distresses or differences or challenges, that if we can realize that this is m- about more than just our comfort or our uh, resolving this problem. It actually is about the glory of God, and um, our our interactions need to be such that, um, you know, if if Paul says whether we eat or drink, we do all to the glory of God, then certainly how we talk to each other should be to the glory of God, and how we resolve or face or resolve issues should be to the glory of God. So we're always facing that challenge, but sometimes if our focus is simply on uh, being comfortable or or getting this problem solved, we can we can lose sight of that bigger picture and and our responsibility and calling to bring glory to Him through our interactions. Yeah, so that's powerful. So what I I think, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but I think what I hear you calling us there is instead of you know me being a spectator to the church I'm involved in and saying, well, you know, does this look glorious to me or doesn't it look glorious Mm -hmm. to me? You're saying, okay, Marlon, step back and think, here's what God wants to do. How are you relating to to your piece of what God's doing in the world, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is part of part of a much bigger thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, We can't just say they got to say me and what. Yes. That's right. What am I doing here? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Maybe if I would press this question a little bit further, though. Um, so one of the passages I think about is chapter 3, verse 10, uh, which you already alluded to. Um, God showing his wisdom to the principalities and powers mm-hmm. um, through the church, his multifaceted wisdom. And... In the flow of that, a lot of that seems to have to do with, you know, the mystery of the gospel, which is, this is not just the Jewish people anymore, and it's not just people who have become proselytized to mm-hmm. to take up that Jewish identity. Um, it's, it's bringing the nations together. So we definitely see that on a global scale, mm. and we see it pictured in Revelation, all gathered around the throne. Um, we see... You know, currently we see the church spreading, spreading through the world. Um, but how much of that is, is it actually important that that happens locally and within concrete relationships, mm. you know, mm-hmm. across cultures, across ethnic lines and so on? Um, yeah. Yeah. Is the glory just that there's a church in Africa and a church in America, or is it people getting along uh-huh. across those backgrounds? That's the constant challenge. It seems like our our tug is toward being together with people who think like us and act like us and live as we do, and and so that that's the constant tug. But I think it's part of the the glory of the work of Christ that uh, brings together diversity into this oneness, a diversity of background and so on. And there certainly is diversity of thought that wouldn't be appropriate to come together. Uh, but but a coming together where we lay down the superficial differences and focus on our unity in Christ. So I love to be in groups where there is this diversity. I, I love where there's um, ethnic difference in our, our background and differences of experience and uh, I've I've been in situations where I've, I've taught where people have come together from different denominations sometimes from different countries and and there's always something thrilling to me to see that coming together and being able to focus on Jesus in in a in a way that that uh, disregards some of the the background and or maybe again the, the superficial differences between us 
Uh, so I, 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 I recognize the tug. I recognize even that maybe there's going to be always be some level of us coming together with like-minded in particular ways that we live out our faith. And yet uh, I think we need to be open to it and, and uh, allowing allowing Jesus to really be the central reason why we are being gathered together, why we're coming together. Yeah, thanks for unpacking that. Um, yeah, anything else you wanted to say here, you know, especially related to how God intends the church to display his glory? Mm. Yeah, the only thing I would say maybe is that I, I need to acknowledge that this probably has been one of the biggest areas of discouragement for me as I think about what we have made of the church with our divisions and bickering over, uh, it seems like, trivial things. We can e more easily see it in other groups than in ourselves. Uh, and I've wondered, I remember as a younger man studying Ephesians, really, and and just feeling like, Lord, what has happened? What have we done? And and feeling... Um, and and asking what are the what can be done and um, it does seem like the fragmentation is something that I don't know I don't know how to undo I don't know that I have the bigger answers but it has led me to a number of personal things that I've purposed and uh, one of them is that I don't ever want to be a person around whom believers gather against other believers. That, that mm -hmm. I don't want to be a part or, and, and particularly leading some kind of a division. Obviously, there has to be a division between the church and the world, but between, um, between believers, just um, not encouraging that. Purposing also that I want personally to, to keep Jesus central so that people that I interact with are drawn toward Jesus, not necessarily toward a particular idea or practice or whatever. Again, ideas are important, practices are important, but but we easily start losing the centrality of Jesus when we're, we're focusing too much on those things. And um, also then uh, another kind of personal purpose is wherever I see a person experiencing Jesus or pursuing Jesus, encouraging that, not looking at the ways in which they're not, but but looking at the at the the ways in which I can encourage. And that's when I interact with neighbors, when I interact with uh, people from other groups or whatever. If 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 they are focused on Jesus, encouraging that and and participating in that, um, because that's that's where our our real unity is is going to lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hear you saying that you've found ways to maybe be more, maybe be more hopeful, and also to you know to really look at what am I doing? What are you doing personally? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And there was a that just reminds me of a uh, section from your commentary that really resonated with me, which was, and I can't quote it exactly, uh, something to the effect of. You know, whenever a group is, group of believers is polemic or defined by what they're against, mm -hmm. you know, there's inevitably this kind of faction mm -hmm. and counter reaction and so mm -hmm. on. And mm -hmm. yeah, heard you calling there to be centered and centered on Jesus and unpacking that. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, mm -hmm. you can't identify. You can't let what you're against become your identity. Right, yeah. <laughs> or it becomes a disaster. Mm -hmm. Even if the thing you're against is bad, it still becomes right. a disaster if yeah. it's your identity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. That's mm -hmm. helpful and encouraging. I've been on, you know, similar <laughs> process of thought, trying to think through <laughs> those issues. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks so much for joining us for this episode. Mm -hmm. Very welcome. Thank you for watching uh, this episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. Um, as we mentioned, I'll be doing another interview with John, uh, releasing soon, um, talking about 
the question, do bad churches glorify God? And diving into how to think about um, some of those difficulties in church. Um, Also, if you have enjoyed this episode, um, you may enjoy um, an interview that we did with Val Yoder, um, which we'll link below, um, talking about an Anabaptist view of church. And thanks for watching. Thank you.